Shen Ya is an ugly, broke, diehard otaku whose disgusting face always landed him in trouble. However, everything changed when he was mistakenly summoned to an isekai world as a demon god. It all began on his way home after another boring day as a cafe intern. As he walked, people kept mistaking him for someone else due to his scarecrow physique, which deeply bothered him. His beaten-up face led people to confuse him for a useless uncle, a woman's husband, and even a washed-up actor. When he finally reached his apartment door and turned the knob to enter, the hallway light began to flicker ominously. Inside his room, he heard strange voices, making him question who was speaking. The eerie voices grew louder, terrifying him, and he realized this was an MTV prank or a joke. At that moment, Shen Yai immediately thought it must have been a ghost who had mistaken him for someone else as usual. Meanwhile, in another world, a group of low-budget Illuminati wannabes summoned the mighty Lord of Ashes. The cult gathering had tied up a hot beauty to sacrifice her to the God of Ashes. Just then, a magical circle appeared, and the cult's high priest trembled excitedly, believing that after 100 years, the God of Ashes would finally emerge into the human world. After uttering the summon chants, the high priest and his brainwashed followers left the temple, expecting their all-powerful god to appear and devour the girl. Unbeknownst to them, Shen Yi was suddenly transported to the temple in a whirlwind of dust and ash. He immediately noticed the unconscious hot chick who was supposed to be sacrificed and was captivated by her thick thighs and ginormous jugs. But on closer inspection, Shen Yi realized she didn't look like the ghost he was expecting, but rather a perfectly unharmed girl so he moved to untie her. As soon as he freed her from the ropes, the girl threw herself to the ground and bowed, calling him the Grand Lord of Ashes. Hearing this, Shen Di knew she must have mistaken him for someone else, as was often the case in his miserable life. However, the girl insisted he was the Lord of Ashes, claiming that as a devout follower, she couldn't possibly have mistaken him. Hearing this, Shen Yi began to genuinely believe that he might actually be some sort of demon god. When he leaned forward and grabbed the girl, she faked fainting. Thinking quickly, Shen Yi decided to offer her a cup of coffee to snap her back to consciousness, only to realize the hottest plot hadn't passed out at all. It was then that Shen Di, after some deep thought, his last two brain cells finally clicked and realized he had transmigrated into another world and become a demon god. With this newfound understanding, he approached the frightened girl and asked for her name, to which she introduced herself as Aina. Sensing how cool it was to finally be important in his otherwise worthless life, Shen Yi decided to play along and act the part. When he offered Aina a cup of coffee, the delusional girl mistook it for some kind of isekai potion meant to take the life of the sacrifice. So she reaffirmed her willingness to offer her life for the summoning, leaving Shen Nai stunned, wondering what he could possibly want with her life. Anna then explained that she was the willing sacrifice used to summon the Grand Lord of Ashes. This revelation made Shen Yi realize that he had been accidentally summoned by the wannabe Illuminati church group. With a newfound sense of authority, Shen Yi ordered Aina to continue living and to be well-fed until the time came when she would be needed as a living sacrifice. Aina regarded the cup of coffee that Shen Yi had offered to her as a powerful burning mythical elixir and expressed her gratitude to the Master Lord of Ashes for favoring her. As she walked out of the church carrying the elixir, a magical sphere enveloped her shielding her from the heavy downpour of rain. Shortly after, she ventured into the big city, marveling at the sights she had never seen before, having grown up as a lowly, useless child in an orphanage. The magnificent view of the city captivated her, but after some time, she decided it was best to return to the church and the ash cult. Meanwhile, Shen Yi was suddenly teleported midair into the big city, landing hard on the ground inside a coffee shop. Dazed and disoriented, he had no idea where he was, but he figured it would be best to sleep first to gather enough energy to think about it later. The next morning, he woke up to find himself still in the strange cult world, inside a coffee shop that looked like it was straight out of Compton. He noticed a photo hanging on the wall and trudged over to take a closer look. The picture featured a loser with a cracked haircut, and Shin Di assumed this disgusting face belonged to the boss of the coffee shop. A few minutes later, a random woman walked past him, ordering a coffee. Shin Di assumed that, once again, his ridiculous face had caused her to mistake him for an employee. Deciding to go along with it, he began helping out, figuring it was best to play the part until the boss arrived. After working for a while, Shen Yi began to wonder why the boss hadn't shown up yet, especially since it was getting late. He started thinking about how he would get paid for all the work he had done. He then decided that, since the boss hadn't come, he might as well sleep in the back room, 
and take some food from the store as his salary for the day's work as a coffee attendant. Meanwhile, elsewhere, the evil cult members paid a visit to a blonde-haired doctor who was supposed to carry out a remodeling operation on Aina, the sacrificial lamb. The sinister blonde doctor commanded the cult followers to escort Aina to the underground operating room, which they obediently did. Once there, the doctor instructed them to leave, ensuring it was just him, Aina, and the container of burning blood left in the room. He then laid Aina on the operating bed, secured her with restraints, and injected her with an anesthetic. With gleeful anticipation, he approached the container of burning blood. As he opened the lid, the doctor's eyes widened with sheer delight, and he screamed in excitement. The burning blood was potent, signaling that this time, the sacrifice to the Master Lord of Ashes was going to be a resounding success. Filled with fervor, he trudged back to Aina and revealed to her that she would be transformed into a child of God. Aina, still groggy from the anesthetic, was bewildered by what the maniac, who seemed like a rip-off version of Dr. Victor Frankenstein, was babbling about. Dr. Maniac explained that becoming the Son of God meant she would become the offspring of the Divine God of the Ash. He further elaborated that he would inject her with the burning blood, which would mutate her body, granting her superhuman powers. The deranged doctor continued, explaining that every member of the cult, including those who financed their activities, aspired to become the Son of God but Aina would be the first to receive this overwhelming gift. With a twisted grin, Dr. Nutshop proceeded to inject Aina with the burning blood, causing her to experience excruciating pain unlike anything she had ever felt before. The intensity of the pain was so overwhelming that she passed out, leading the doctor to mistakenly believe she had died, concluding that she wasn't strong enough to become the offspring of the Grand Lord of Ashes. However, within her subconscious mind, Aina resolved to survive. Meanwhile, back at the coffee shop, Shin Yi briefly thought about Aina but quickly dismissed the thought, not wanting to be reminded of the church and its psychiatric members. However, before he could fully push the thoughts away, he began to hear strange voices, and the ground started to tremble as if an earthquake was underway. It dawned on him that somewhere, someone was chanting a summoning ritual. At that moment, a strange light appeared, and Shin Yi braced himself, thinking he was about to be summoned back to his world. But after what felt like an eternity, nothing happened. Suddenly, an intense sensation flared up in his chest, like his heart was being scorched to a crisp. The burning pain became unbearable, and Shen Yi began to panic, thinking this was some kind of punishment from the real Master Lord of Ashes for impersonating him. The searing pain eventually migrated from his chest to his palm, making dumb MC believe he'd somehow gained the ability to cast flames from his hands like Marvel's Human Torch. Fueled by the confidence of a chicka chad, Shen Yi leaped out of bed and started doing some hand movements, hoping to summon flames. To his shock, a powerful flame did indeed materialize, scaring the shit out of him. He quickly closed his palms, and the fire fizzled out. Realizing that he might be the strongest mage alive, almost godlike, Shen Yi excitedly tried casting flames a few more times, and each time, the fire appeared at his command. This newfound ability made Shen Yi incredibly happy and he discovered that the flames could even form letters or words based on his thoughts. Emboldened by this, he decided to test the extent of his power by burning a few items. He picked up a cookbook and tried to set it ablaze, but his excitement quickly faded when he realized that his fiery powers were just for show. They couldn't actually burn anything. Meanwhile, back in the operating room, Aina finally woke up from her unconscious state just as the junkie doctor was about to leave, assuming she had died. Aina slowly got up and called out to him, startling the doctor. Seeing her alive, the doctor realized that the ritual had been successful since she had survived. Elated, the doctor instructed the followers to inform the high priest to prepare for the next phase of the ritual. A few months later, Shen Yai had reluctantly settled into his life at the coffee shop, in the absence of the boss who never returned. The prolonged solitude gave him plenty of time to reflect, and he eventually realized that the only thing he truly wanted was to go back home. One day, he began hearing summoning chants again, but having heard them countless times over the past months without being teleported anywhere, he dismissed them as more background noise. He closed up the shop, took a shower, and lay in bed, his thoughts drifting to Aina and the dangers of being summoned without warning. Shen Ye worried about the possibility of appearing in the midst of cultists or serial killers, who might discover he was an imposter and his life. Just as these thoughts plagued his mind, the summoning chance he had dismissed earlier suddenly intensified. Amidst swirling smoke and ash, Shinji vanished, 
Meanwhile, just minutes before this happened, back at the church, the moronic cult group had gathered to perform the summoning chants, mainly to impress the church's financiers. The ugly old high priest with the face of a depressed donkey didn't believe Anna's claims that the Master Lord of Ashes would return, dismissing her as just another delusional fool with screws loosed inside of her head. But as he uttered the chants, heavy rain began to fall, and a bright light emerged in the middle of the church, stunning the old ugly. The high priest immediately thought of Ana's words, but it seemed impossible. The Master Lord of Ashes had only appeared twice in a thousand years, and the idea that he would appear twice in a month was beyond belief. Before the old fool could finish his thoughts, the entire place was enveloped in choking smoke and ash. In that moment, Shen Yai appeared in the form of a mythical being, leaving the entire congregation in awe as they beheld the glorious sight they had waited for years to witness. Aina, who had been eagerly awaiting the return of her god, was thrilled to see her divine crush once more. Meanwhile, the high priest of the church was petrified, immediately begging for forgiveness for disturbing the peace of such a mighty god. As Shen Yai looked around, he wondered why these worthless beings had summoned him again. His eyes landed on Aina, and he couldn't help but admire her massive milkers. Meanwhile, the high priest, anxious about what to do next, realized that the congregation would expect him to deliver a message from the god. Thinking quickly, he decided to offer the mask of change unbounded as a sacrifice to the god and then try to steer the situation in a different direction. But as Shen Yai glared at the high priest, he couldn't help but think that the old man looked like he came from a bloodline of trauma to look so damn ugly. So he decided to keep his distance from the serial killer. At that moment, the high priest began to cry for his mother, terrified that the god's silence meant he was angry and that punishment was imminent. Sensing the tension in the air, Shen Yi decided to speak, announcing to the congregation that he had accepted their offerings. Just then, the mask of change unbounded began to levitate, startling Shen Yi. He then grabbed the mask out of the air, shocking the gullible worshippers, leading them to believe their sacrifice had indeed been accepted. Seeing this, the high priest was relieved, but he also started to worry that the appearance of the God of Ashes might bring disaster and chaos to the world, as it had in the past. He began to beg the God not to destabilize the world as he once did. Before the high priest could finish his plea, Aina interrupted, yelling at the old loser to shut up before it was too late. God did. She lucky wanted the God to punish all the disgusting worshippers, so she loudly declared that they were not faithful followers but disgusting liars and pretenders. She accused them of approaching the god only for profit and violating the oracle whenever it suited them. Her words enraged the filthy old priest, who ordered Aina to shut her dirty mouth, reminding her that she was just a deserted orphan who did nothing but slack around with boys in the temple. These words angered Shen Yi, and he unleashed his flames, frightening the high priest and his foolish followers. Shen Yi realized that Aina was still being treated like a worthless dog in the temple. So he commanded the worshippers to treat her with respect and allow her to live well, just like any human being, without mistreating her. Witnessing the terrifying display of power, the shaken high priest had no choice but to accept the god's command. Before leaving, Shen Yai sternly instructed them not to summon him without a good reason, as he was not some jobless god to be called upon for trivial matters. On the other hand, Aina, who had initially believed the god of ashes to be a brutal and terrifying figure due to the horrifying stories she had heard, was stunned to realize that the god was actually cool and far less menacing than she had imagined. As Shen Di disappeared, the mood in the church returned to its chaotic norm, with the crazy worshippers erupting into a frenzy, screaming like they were in a mental asylum. At that moment, Dr. Ugly burst into the church, demanding to know when it had turned into a madhouse. The high priest urgently informed the doctor that they needed to leave the premises immediately because the anti-magic bureau would likely be rushing over. However, the doctor, furious, insisted on knowing exactly what had happened, which enraged the high priest. With glowing eyes, the high priest refused to reveal anything, instead informing the doctor that only Aina truly understood the Lord of Ashes and that she should be treated with respect. He added that Aina was born for the Lord of Ashes and was an object of divine favor. Realizing Aina was the only one being treated specially by the God of Ash, the useless old weirdo tried to act friendly, telling her to let bygones be bygones. But Aina, seeing through his deceit, removed his filthy hands from her and told him to keep that same energy. A week later, a mysterious man named Byron entered the coffee shop. Upon seeing Shen Yi, he immediately sensed his disgusting aura, recognizing it as the same as the Lord of Ashes. 
He wondered who this weak-ass loser was, wielding such massive power, clearly hinting at Shen Yai. As Shen Yai approached Byron's table to take his order, Byron requested a black coffee. While Shen Yi prepared the coffee, Byron stared at him angrily, suspecting that Shen Yi might be an offspring of the Lord of Ashes sent to stop him. When Shen Yi brought the coffee, Byron chugged it, thinking it might be a potion. Realizing it was just regular coffee, he concluded that Shen Yi wasn't truly his enemy after all. A few minutes later, Shen Yi noticed a glass jar filled with paper cranes and asked Byron about it. Byron explained that the jar was made by his daughter and the paper cranes represented her unfulfilled wishes. He added that although he had wanted to fulfill those wishes, his daughter had tragically passed away, so he kept the jar as a relic to remember her by. Moved by the sad tale, Shin Ye consoled him, encouraging him to move on and be happy, as that's what his daughter would have wanted. Unbeknownst to Shen Yi, Byron had resolved to bring his dead daughter back using black magic and didn't want the Lord of Ashes or any other magical being to interfere with his plan. Shortly afterwards, Byron left the coffee shop, bidding Shen Yi goodbye. But before he could leave, Shen Yi called out to remind him that he hadn't paid for the coffee yet. As Byron left, he thought about his plan to dispose of the Lord of Ashes and use his kin as a summoning sacrifice. He was determined to use dark sorcery, a forbidden art, to summon his untouchable exterior god and resurrect his beloved daughter. The next day, Shen Yi immersed himself in studying books about the god of Ash hoping to make sense of the powers and the bizarre events he'd been caught up in. As he delved into the ancient texts, he discovered that the god of Ash was like any other exterior god, powerful yet dormant, showing little interest in the mundane world. The god was said to reward devoted followers, but to Shen Yi, it all sounded like a story ripped straight from a cartoon plot. As he continued reading, Shen Yi's mind wandered down memory lane to a darker time in his past. Back then, life had been miserable for him, Bad luck followed him everywhere, and his spirit was crushed under the weight of it all. Desperate to escape the nightmare his life had become, he dabbled in rituals, turning to an ancient book he found in his hometown. In his reckless desperation, Shen Ya hadn't bothered to read the book's content carefully. He just jumped headfirst into performing the ritual. The ritual was complicated, requiring a table and specific names to be written down and pasted on it, and then the table had to be turned a few times. But after hours of waiting, nothing happened. He was still the same broke loser. Yet something inside him believed that this ritual might somehow be connected to his transmigration to this strange new world. Back in the present, Shen Ye considered his current life and realized that not much had changed. He was still a pathetic, worthless nobody, even with his flame powers that seemed utterly useless. His eyes fell on the mask he had received during his second summoning ritual. Curious about its purpose, he decided to try it on and look in the mirror. To his horror, his ugly face had become even uglier, resembling light-skinned Kenny East. Shen Yi then had the idea to test whether the mask could grant him a complete makeover. As he focused, he found himself transforming into the LG Red Power Ranger. Excited by this newfound ability, he felt like he had stumbled upon a cheat code to life. Hours later, Shen Yi began to hear summoning chants and wondered who was dragging him into another mess this time. Meanwhile, in an ancient castle, Byron stood in the middle of a glowing magical circle, holding a knife and uttering an ancient chant passed down through the ages. Byron didn't give a damn about the consequences of his actions, even though summoning gods was strictly prohibited in the city. His only concern was resurrecting his dead daughter. As he completed the chant, a thick white fog enveloped the temple. When it cleared, Shen Di, not wearing the magical mask and having taken on Byron's appearance, emerged. Shen Mi had quickly assessed the situation, realizing that Byron must have been the one who summoned him there. On the other hand, Byron was initially confused as to why the god he summoned looked like his twin. But then, in a moment of clarity, Byron's brain cells snapped, and he concluded that the gods must take on the appearance projected by human minds. Byron wasted no time in making his request, pleading with the god to resurrect his beloved daughter. As an offering, he presented a giant red lizard monster which was then transformed into a burning chaos seed after being accepted by the god. In that moment, Shen Di thought it best to continue pretending to be Byron, recognizing that using his own disgusting appearance might pose a danger. Despite his earlier prayer seemingly going unanswered, Byron loudly repeated his request for his daughter to be resurrected. Upon hearing the request this time, Shen Di confessed to Byron that he lacked the ability to bring his daughter back to life. 
Shen Yi then recalled from ancient texts that the god of Ash was known for granting fertility and bountiful harvests to his devout followers. However, since he had manifested as the god of the white heavenly fog, he could only offer knowledge, as that was the heavenly fog god's gift. He pondered deeply about what extraordinary knowledge he could provide Byron, but being a brain-dead loser, he couldn't come up with any life-changing knowledge. After nearly an hour of contemplation, Shen Yi decided to share an otherworldly piece of knowledge. He planned to use the ruse that if Byron couldn't grasp it, he could blame Byron's low IQ as an excuse. Meanwhile, Byron grew impatient with the silent god, assuming his offering had been insufficient. At that moment, Shen Yi revealed the great knowledge by asking Byron a riddle. What has four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs at night? However, Brian had no idea what the heck the mor god was talking about. Realizing Byron couldn't solve the riddle, Shen Yi vanished, dissolving into air particles but not before advising Byron to think more deeply. A short while later, Shen Yi reappeared at the coffee shop, pleased with having pulled off another summoning scam. He wondered if this was the new life destiny had in store for him, and whether there would be more summons in the future. To keep a record for posterity, he decided to document all the summonings he had responded to, along with the names of the summoners and the purpose of each summon. Afterwards, Shen Yi tried to see if he had gained any new powers, but after a few hand gestures, he found he was still limited to the harmless fire. Gazing at the mask, he thought its disguising ability was indeed effective and would surely be useful in the future. He also recalled the burning chaos seed and thought it might prove valuable later, so he stored it in a box along with the mask. Later that night, Shen Yi went to sleep, but while he was in slumberland, the burning seed materialized back into the giant lizard. Upon seeing Shen Yi, the lizard immediately recognized his aura as that of the Lord of Ashes and wondered why the mighty lord had turned into a man with the face of a sick hyena. Terrified by the dog's face, the lizard fled the house transforming into a stray cat as it escaped into the dark street. In another part of the city, George and a ranked investigator renowned for handling disaster-level crisis solo was alerted by the Anti-Magic Bureau about a case involving a child holding a mysterious cup who had summoned an evil god. The gravity and confidentiality of the situation prompted George to act swiftly and investigate. A few days later, George found himself at Shen Yi's coffee shop, drawn by the overwhelming aura emanating from it. Upon seeing George, Shen Yi offered him a latte, but George, after assessing Shen Yi, dismissed him as a useless lowlife who couldn't possibly be the source of such a powerful aura. However, George decided to interrogate Shen Yi and asked if he had noticed any supernatural occurrences lately. Shen Yi was taken aback by the question, wondering if his summoning secrets had finally been uncovered. Trying to deflect, he started talking about the bad weather instead. Realizing that his visit to the shop was as pointless as Shen Yi's worthless face, George decided to leave. But just as George was exiting, Shen Yi suddenly felt a chill down his spine, as though his latent powers were surging. He activated his main character abilities and quickly discovered that he could manipulate the internal flow of his mana. In that moment, he transformed into gas and back to his normal form. Thrilled that this new ability could help him escape dangerous situations, before he could fully process this discovery, George abruptly stormed back into the cafe, startling Shen Yi, who was nearly caught using his powers. George insisted that he could sense a strong aura of the evil god lingering around the shop, even from a distance. Hearing this, Shen Yi nearly panicked and tried to change the subject by offering George another cup of coffee. When George agreed, Shen Yi quickly made an excuse about needing to fetch more coffee supplies from the back of the shop and hurriedly left. In Shen Yi's absence, George took the opportunity to scan the entire shop and found Shen Yi's phone on a table. He began scrolling through it and eventually stumbled upon a picture in the gallery that Shen Yi had taken earlier at the ancient castle, where he was summoned by Byron. Seeing this photo only strengthened George's suspicion that something fishy was definitely going on. A few minutes later, Shen Yi returned to the shop, looking for George, only to realize that the shitface had already left. Meanwhile, George had arrived at the ancient castle, where Byron had first summoned Shen Mi. Upon arriving, George immediately sensed the lingering aura of the exterior god. In that instant, a giant monstrous lizard appeared before him, its two glowing eyes filled with menace. Realizing that what remained in the castle was not the remnant of the Lord of Ashes, but something even more dangerous, George prepared himself. In the blink of an eye, the lizard launched an attack, whipping its tail at George. With a Spider-Man move, 
George leaped high into the air and unleashed his signature blade, driving it into the lizard's head. The injured lizard then fled from the castle, leaving George behind. After the unexpected encounter, George exited the castle, his thoughts turning to his friend Byron, wondering how he was faring. He also concluded that the residual aura in the castle made it clear that someone had attempted to summon the white heavenly fog. With this in mind, George decided to write a detailed report on the situation to the Anti-Magic Bureau. Several months later, Shinyi was experimenting with his powers at the coffee shop, eventually learning to summon both flames and mist simultaneously. Later, as he prepared for bed, he thought about George, who had been the shop's only customer for months. However, Shen Yi had brushed off these thoughts and soon drifted into a deep sleep. In his dream, he found himself in an ash temple, which he thought might be the domain of the Lord of Ashes. Suddenly, he spotted Aina, and in his usual strange manner, the cultured weirdo decided to play with her body before leaving, promising to see her again. Unbeknownst to Shen Yi, this wasn't just a dream. Somewhere in the city, Aina had used a technique to contact the Lord of Ashes again before going to sleep, and was thrilled that it had worked. But suddenly, she felt an intense heat on her back, prompting her to remove her clothes, revealing an insignia engraved by the Lord of Ashes. Days later, Shindy found himself thinking about Aina and how she had been appearing frequently in his dreams. He mused that awkward as their encounters had been, it was better than meeting in person and risking the evil cult discovering his whereabouts. Before he could finish his thoughts, Aina unexpectedly walked into the coffee shop, shocking Shen Yai. In that moment, he considered putting on his disguise mask, but he remembered it was still in the box in his room. Shen Yai wondered how Aina had found him and concluded that the cult must have some prophetic abilities. Deciding to play along, he approached Aina and asked what she wanted and why she had sought out the Lord of Ashes. Aina responded that nothing had happened, so Shen Di offered her coffee but realizing that the word coffee didn't exist in her universe, he instead offered her a PG-rated grape juice. As he prepared the drink, Shen Ye, still maintaining the persona of the Lord of Ashes, asked Aina how she had found him. She explained that she had simply sensed his presence in the coffee shop, thanks to the powerful aura of the Lord of Ashes that permeated the place. Aina then tasted the grape juice and thought it was the best thing she had ever had. Meanwhile, Shen Ye returned to the counter, assuring her that the Lord of Ashes would always watch over her and wouldn't abandon her like her useless father. Just then, George walked into the store, his clothes smeared with blood, sending a wave of fear down Shen Yi's spine, who began to sweat bucket. Seeing George, Shen Ye wondered why the Minecraft-shaped head had to come at such bad timing. Realizing that Aina was still in the room and thinking it best that they never meet, However, George sat down and revealed to Shen Di that he was an investigator working with the Anti-Magic Bureau, tasked with maintaining human civilization. George added that he needed a favor from Shen Di. Shen Di suggested they discuss it over a cup of coffee, but as he went to prepare it, he realized he needed to get rid of one of the two menaces in the shop as quickly as possible. Just then, Aina approached the counter and disclosed that the Lord of Ashes' devoted followers were facing a serious assassination threat from the Tranquil Tongue, and there might be a need to summon him again. Shen Yai assured her that the Lord of Ashes would handle the Tranquil Tongue and that she didn't need to worry, so Aina left the store. A few minutes after she left, Shen Yi brought the coffee to George, who revealed that he was looking for someone associated with a cult that posed a serious threat to the city's stability and the Anti-Magic Bureau had sent him to eliminate this threat. George then handed Shen Yai a blurry picture of Aina as the target, leaving Shen Yai stunned. In that moment, Shen Yi considered his next move and decided not to betray Aina. Instead, he told George that he would look into the matter and try to find the girl in the photo. However, George became suspicious of Shen Yi's response, wondering how he knew the person in the picture was a female since the picture was blurry. Despite his suspicions, George felt confident he had asked the right person for help and promised to repay Shen Di with a gift for his assistance. Meanwhile, on the rooftop of the ancient castle, Byron approached his servant, Yana, who demanded a pay raise for her hard work in assisting him during his dangerous summoning rituals and his quest to find his daughter. Byron agreed to increase her pay and then prepared for another summoning session. The psychopath took a sharp blade, stabbed his hand, and let the blood flow onto the magical summoning circle. As he finished chanting the summoning incantation, Shen Yi materialized before him. Wasting no time, Shen Yi, fully aware that Byron was obsessed with resurrecting his daughter, bluntly told him that she could never be brought back to life. 
However, Byron refused to give up and insisted on gaining some insight into how to revive her. Shindi then told him that a worthy sacrifice would be required before he could provide such knowledge again. Byron then offered his silver fate ring, which brings good fortune during the day and increases bad luck at night. On seeing the silver ring, Shen Yi was immediately fascinated, as he was strapped for cash and needed money to pay the bills at his coffee shop. Realizing the ring is a valuable means to a cash out, he quickly took it like a desperate common. Just as Shen Yi was thinking of the next convincing line to feed the gullible Byron, the door to the ancient castle opened and Eve, Byron's long-deceased daughter, appeared in the flesh, stunning everyone. Eve revealed that while she was in her eternal sleep like Aurora, then she heard a voice calling her to wake up. Upon seeing Eve, Shen Yi was thrilled, believing that Byron would think he was responsible for bringing her back to life. However, the crack brain father was instead worried that he hadn't received any new knowledge and feared that God was dissatisfied with his sacrifice. At that moment, Byron briefly considered offering his newly revived daughter as a sacrifice to gain more knowledge. But when Eve called out to him, asking why he was acting like a lunatic, her sweet voice softened Byron's cold stone heart. He changed his mind on sending her back to the devil when she came, wrapped her tightly in a warm embrace, and vowed to find a better sacrifice next time, even if it was the last thing he did. Some weeks later, Shen Yi continued to train and strengthen his missed powers, trying to discover their full wrong gate and capabilities. He then remembered the silver ring he received from Byron and realized he didn't know how it worked. Determined to understand the supernatural world better, he decided to seek information about the occult. Despite the heavy downpour that day, Shen Yi set out to gather information, using the photos he had taken of Byron's ancient castle as a guide. Using his phone city map, Shen Yi boarded a bus that took him to an observation deck directly opposite Byron's castle. Upon arriving at the deck, he realized he was probably the only idiot in the world foolish enough to venture to such a high place in such terrible weather. However, to his surprise, he found another wacko there, which stunned him. Shen Yai glanced at the random girl and noticed that she seemed very young, probably a college student, but he chose to ignore her and focus on his task. Using a telescope, Shen Yi peered at Byron's castle and was amazed by the luxury of the villa, wondering if Byron was a bank robber, besides being an evil sorcerer, to have such a magnificent castle. At the same time, the random girl named Su Ling was approached by George, who was surprised to find that the Anti-Magic Bureau had appointed a young girl as his new partner. However, Su Ling assured George that she wasn't a high school student, but college student with over 10 years of experience as a B-rank investigator. George thought it was all BS and kept insisting that Su Ling was just a teenager who shouldn't be employed by the Anti-Magic Bureau, which made Su Ling angry. She yelled at him, saying he was too old for the job and that his age was probably written in Roman numerals. Not wanting to argue with the arrogant Gen Z any further, George decided to get down to business. He informed her that a cult was planning another summoning at a club in the city and that they had already found a sacrifice powerful enough for the ritual. After listening to George, Su Ling suggested they continue the conversation somewhere outside the heavy rain and over dinner. Although George was reluctant to buy dinner for the arrogant child who just roasted him, he had no choice, so he took her to his favorite coffee shop. A few hours later, Shen Yi, who had finally arrived home, took a shower and considered his next move to find the occult information he needed. He decided that his next stop would be the library. Just then, he heard a voice outside the cafe and rushed to attend to the customer. When he got there, he saw that it was George and Su Ling. As he took their order, Su Ling sensed the overwhelming godlike aura emanating from Shen Yi. Realizing that the dude was no ordinary barista, which left her stunned. Upon seeing Su Ling, Shen Yi asked George if the Anti-Magic Bureau had started employing high school teenagers which immediately bruised Su Ling's ego. She despised nothing more than being mistaken for a teenager. Furious, she was about to draw her sword to give Shen Yi's head a proper shape, but instead, she angrily asserted that she was a college student. George, still hurt from the roasting he had received from Su Ling earlier, decided to team up with Shen Yi. Together, they delivered the ultimate comeback, saying that her father must have abandoned her because she was too ugly, choosing to go mountain climbing instead. After sharing a laugh at Su Ling's expense, George quickly returned to business. George asked Shen Yai if he had gathered any information on the girl in the blurry photo since their last meeting. Shen Yai suggested they discuss it over a cup of coffee. As they sat down, George revealed that a cult was planning to sacrifice the entire city to summon an exterior god. 
He explained that even if the god didn't have malicious intent, the mere presence of such a being would be unbearable for ordinary people, so the cult had to be stopped. Shen Di thought deeply and realized that with such a large-scale sacrifice, if he were the god being summoned, his identity would be exposed to the entire world. He then remembered Aina mentioning earlier that the Ash Cult was being hunted down by a group called the Tranquil Tongue. Shen Di then shared with George that the Tranquil Tongue might be the cult planning the larger-scale city sacrifice. Upon hearing this, George disclosed that the Tranquil Tongue had been responsible for previous attacks on the Anti-Magic Bureau, and the Bureau still hadn't figured out the cult's true intentions. After receiving this information, George offered Shen Yi a package as partial payment for his help. However, Shen Yi wisely declined, knowing that accepting it might obligate him to reveal information about Aina, which he didn't want to do. He asked George to hold onto the package for now, and hinted that the girl in the blurry photo wasn't a bad person, subtly referring to Aina. Later that afternoon, Shen Yi headed to the city library to gather information about the cults and their activities. Upon arriving at the library, he faced the challenge of entering without being caught. So he pulled off his ultimate disguise by transforming into mist and using the mask to impersonate a city college student named Arthur. Inside the library, he found records detailing the national chaos caused by the Ash Order. He discovered that many years ago, the Ash Order had summoned the Grand Lord of Ash, causing a major national disaster that nearly burned the entire city to ashes. The Ash Order had wielded immense power and influence, but their reign was short-lived as they were overthrown by the Corona Order, rendering the Ash Order irrelevant. He also learned that the Tranquil Tongue aimed to achieve a tranquil mind only the exterior god could grant, which was why they planned to sacrifice the entire nation. Just then Byron, mistaking Shen Ya in disguise for Arthur, his student, called out to him and asked why he wasn't on sick leave, catching Shen Yi completely off guard. Shen Ya immediately thought quickly and told Byron that someone had asked him to link up at the library. He tried to excuse himself by claiming that his sickness was returning and that he needed to get quarantined. However, before he could leave, Byron caught sight of the occult book Shen Yi was holding and demanded to know when he had taken an interest in such things. Shen Ya hastily explained that he found the book amusing, filled with stories meant to fool gullible extremists. After giving this excuse, he attempted to leave, but Byron insisted they take a walk together, putting Shen Ya in a tight spot. As they walked through the facility, Byron suddenly halted and mentioned that he needed to check on something in the activity room. During their walk, Shen Ye still couldn't wrap his mind around the fact that Byron was a lecturer at the city university by day and an evil sorcerer by night. A few minutes later, Byron returned, and they walked outside into the heavy rainfall. Shen Yai, tense and worried that Byron might see through his disguise, wouldn't stop rambling about the books he had read in the library. Suddenly, Byron paused and revealed that he had confirmed in the activity room that the real Arthur was still homesick, which stunned Shen Yi. Byron demanded to know who the imposter was and why he was at the library. Before Shen Yi could answer, the villain snapped his fingers, momentarily pausing the raindrops and threatened to chop Shen Ye nicely into tiny pieces and use him as fish bait. Realizing how dire the situation was, Shen Di transformed into mist, exposing his white heavenly fog god aura to Byron. At that moment, Byron felt the same aura he had experienced when he summoned the exterior god while trying to resurrect his daughter. He realized that the man before him wasn't ordinary, but a god. Byron then explained that he had joined the Tranquil Tongue cult and meant no harm. Shen Yi delivered a disgusting lie, claiming he was merely a messenger of the exterior gods, sent to discover why Byron had joined the Tranquil Tongue. Byron disclosed that he joined the cult, which aimed to isekai all of humanity because they promised him a disaster-grade relic. He had planned to sacrifice this relic to the White Heavenly Fog God in exchange for the God to stop watching over his daughter. Hearing this, Shen Yi demanded that Byron betray the Tranquil Tongue and expose their evil agenda in writing, which Brian agreed to. The day after, Shen Yi grew increasingly concerned about George's absence from the coffee shop, especially as the day of the Tranquil Tongue summoning that would isekai the entire nation drew near. He had crucial information he needed to share with George. At the same time, he recalled what Aina had revealed to him the day before about the Ash Cult's own summoning scheduled for that day. Meanwhile, at the counter, a bitter lady wouldn't stop ranting to Shen Yi about her cheating boyfriend. After enduring her boring speech for what felt like an eternity, Shen Yi finally advised her, somewhat politely, to go screw herself, 
explaining that he had more pressing matters to attend to. The woman stormed off angrily. As the hours passed, Shen Yai eagerly awaited the Ash Cult's summoning, but grew worried that something terrible might have happened to Aina, since he had not been summoned yet. Meanwhile, at the Ash Cult's church, chaos erupted as the useless Frankenstein doctor was isekated by members of the Tranquil Tongue, sending shivers down the spines of the Ash Cult members. Despite the growing fear, the old high priest with a stomach-turning face tried to rally the cult, urging them not to lose faith because the mighty Lord of the Ash would soon be summoned. Just then, another cult member staggered into the church, clutching his neck as if he had been poisoned, and within seconds, he collapsed and entered Nirvana. However, his life didn't matter as the high priest continued to insist that everything was fine, even though it was obvious nothing was fine. He assured the cult members that once the Lord of the Ash was summoned, the tranquil tongue would be wiped out from the face of the earth. Suddenly, another member burst into the temple, announcing that the entire defense surrounding the premises had been obliterated, leaving the cult members in shock. Realizing the dire situation, the high priest then urged everyone to evacuate, insisting that Aina come with him to find the messenger of the god she had encountered at the coffee store, hinting at Shen Yi. Just then, a massive explosion rocked the building. Aina, thanks to her body being strengthened by the previous remolding experiment, survived the blast with only minor injuries. She emerged from the rubble, clutching the severed hand of the high priest, which was still gripping onto her. Determined, Aina ran out of the collapsed building, ignoring the burning paint of the insignia on her back, and headed straight to the coffee store to find Shen Nye. After several hours of intense running, she finally arrived at the coffee store, but collapsed from exhaustion at the entrance. As this was happening, members of the Tranquil Tongue watched silently from the rooftop of a nearby building. A few minutes later, members of the Tranquil Tongue cult approached the entrance of the coffee shop, only to find the Burning Seed, who had transformed into an adorable cat. One of the loser cult members couldn't help but become completely captivated by how cute the cat was. Suddenly, a blindingly bright light appeared, and the cat transformed into the red giant monster lizard. Upon seeing the monstrous burning chaos seed, the group of mentally deranged cult members scattered, screaming for safety. However, one worthless loser was devoured like sushi before he could escape, while another was impaled through the chest by the monster lizard's pincers. The rest of the sissy cult members tried to flee, but one unfortunate member was sliced in half like an onion. Afterwards, the monster lizard approached Aina, who was lying unconscious on the ground, and attempted to devour her. At that moment, Aina awoke from her slumber. Realizing the imminent danger, she backed against the wall, cornered and with the lizard advancing to finish her. She desperately moved to defend herself using her palm, unleashing a massive inferno that nearly scorched the monster. However, the monster lizard emerged unscathed. As it lunged forward, it realized that Aina was special, chosen by the Lord of Ashes, so it retreated, transforming back into a cat. Meanwhile, Shen Yi, who had been inside the house the whole time all this was happening, wondered what the heck was going on outside, so he went to investigate. Stepping outside, he found Aina resting against a pillar, so he rushed and carried her back inside. Once inside, he tried to revive her and ended up stripping her. Seeing a naked woman's benefits for the first time, the simp was dying in the background and immediately started to bleed from his nose. However, he suddenly noticed that Aina's wounds were healing and her skin was regenerating, leaving him stunned. The next day, Aina woke up feeling much better and suddenly recalled the events of the previous night, how she had fainted at the entrance of the messenger's coffee shop and was saved by him. After remembering, she went downstairs to the coffee lounge to thank Shen Di for saving her. However, when she arrived, she noticed the dude looked like he was run over by a train, so she told him that his appearance wasn't eco-friendly. However, Shen Di explained that he hadn't slept at all the previous night because he feared a monster might be lurking around the shop. He also revealed that in the morning, he had gone to the library to review the details left behind by Byron, and afterward, he visited the Anti-Magic Bureau to see George, but the investigators threatened to beat him senseless for having such a disgusting face. Moments later, as they had breakfast, Shen Yi demanded to know what had happened with the Ash Cult and why he wasn't summoned the day before. Anan explained everything that had occurred and revealed that the order needed to exist, or else the orphanage wouldn't be able to meet its basic needs. She added that even though the cult was like family to her, she despised the sacrifices and the forced remodeling of living people. Hearing this, Shen Yi realized that Aina had grown over time. She was no longer the worthless and dense person she used to be, but had become a brave woman with considerable inner strength. 
Just then, the evil cat appeared out of nowhere, and Aina thought it was the cutest thing she had ever seen. Shinyai told her that the cat's name was Kola and urged her to give it a hug, assuring her that it was friendly. As Shinyai got up to go to his room to rest, Aina tried to hug the seemingly harmless cat, but its face suddenly transformed into the ugly lizard monster, scaring her. She immediately rushed to meet Shendi and insisted on following him to the room, refusing to stay alone with the murderous cat. Meanwhile, at the anti-magic bureau office, George complained about the physical strain required by the job, but Su Ling told him to stop whining and quit if his bones were becoming weak. A few hours later, the old man and Su Ling headed to the coffee shop to discuss the recent events with Shen Yi. Once inside, George informed Shen Yi that the bureau planned to make their move that night, but for the tranquil tongue to completely annihilate a rival cult and attack the anti-magic bureau in one night, they must be very powerful. George then asked Shen Ya if he could personally handle the tranquil tongue on behalf of the bureau, but Shen Di declined. He angrily questioned whether George's wish was to get him eliminated. Shen Yi then suggested trying to negotiate with the tranquil tongue, asking them to drop their brain-dead idea of ice Kang the nation for some crackhead god. Realizing how foolish his request had been, George apologized for asking too much and left with Su Ling. As they departed, Aina came to greet them, but Shen Yi told her that the pair of crazy people were gone and that it was better she didn't meet them. Later that night, the anti-magic bureau department was attacked by the Tranquil Tongue cult. George tried to fend off the assault but quickly realized they were unprepared for such an invasion. He suspected there might be a mole within the bureau, as the cult had chosen to strike on a day when most of the investigators guarding the entrance were off duty. After battling numerous cult members, George decided to head to the location where the sacrifice was taking place. Meanwhile, Su Ling was attacked by a monstrous insect with bulging, menacing red eyes. As the insect moved to strike, she swiftly sliced it up like cabbage, but suddenly felt a sharp pain in her ribcage. Ignoring the pain, she pressed on towards the sacrifice site, only to be shot in the shoulder blade by another cult member who resembled a sickly hyena. Unbeknownst to the ugly attacker, the anti-magic bureau had injected its agents with ancient deep sea blood, making them immune to conventional weapons. In the blink of an eye, Su Ling charged at the coward like a seasoned Call of Duty player and sliced off his hand with ease. But she didn't stop there. The badass proceeded to slash every part of his body, ruthlessly eliminating the threat. A few hours later, Su Ling met up with George and the remaining anti-magic bureau investigators. She then instructed them to proceed to the side of the ongoing sacrifice. George, however, was displeased that Su Ling had operated alone despite them being partners who should work together. Su Ling, unfazed, told the old depressed man, who should have died last week, to sort out his feelings on his own. The team then set out to be Sakai, the powerful high priest of the Tranquil Tongue named Villard. At the same time, the sacrifice and summoning ritual were underway on the rooftop of the cult's club, with the Tranquil Tongue high priest chanting the summoning incantations. As the leader invoked the mighty exterior god, he began to ascend toward the sky on magical stairs. At that moment, George and Su Ling arrived, and witnessed a large magical circle forming in the sky, with an ominous figure emerging from within it. Meanwhile, back at the cafe, Shen Ye sensed that someone was summoning an exterior god. In an instant, he vanished, leaving Aina behind. At the same time, George finally caught sight of the tranquil tongue leader, whom he believed to be Villard, and launched an attack with his magical blade. With precise aim, he hurled his dagger at the cult high priest and impaled his heart, but to his shock, the absolute menace wouldn't die. A few minutes later, Shen Yi found himself appearing before the cult leader, now transformed into the summoned god called the Silent Singer. Upon seeing Shen Yi, the Tranquil Tong High Priest offered him a sacrifice, the ever-fading cross, in exchange for a truly eternal tranquil mind. The eternal tranquil mind was the ability to become a desireless and emotionless mortal, free of pain, struggle, resentment, and aspiration. Shen Yi then accepted the sacrifice, taking the ever-fading cross, but he refused to grant the high priest's request, leaving him stunned. This was the first time Shen Yai had rejected a request after receiving a sacrifice, and it excited him. He resolved never to concede to any cultist who threatened the city or Aina. When the high priest's request for an eternal tranquil mind was denied, he began to fall from the magical circle in the sky. At that moment, Shen Yi disappeared from the circle. Realizing the enemy had fallen from the sky, 
Su Ling ordered the anti-magic squad to start arresting all members of the Tranquil Tong. However, George decided to check on the fallen high priest, who he thought was Villard, his old friend who had turned to evil. He assumed the high priest, after falling from such a height, would be either dead or severely injured. Upon reaching the scene of the fallen high priest, George moved to finish him off but was shocked to discover that the useless high priest of the Tranquil Tong wasn't Villard as he had thought. Confused, he wondered if Shen Yai had given him false information. A few hours later, Shen Yi reappeared at the cafe and decided to pet his evil cat. Just then, Aina approached him and revealed that she had received intel that some members of the Ash Cult had actually survived the collapse of the church. Even the most useless Sissy High Priest had survived, and they were demanding that Aina return to the church. Although Shen Yi didn't want that Nope factory to leave, Aina insisted because of her responsibilities to the children at the orphanage, so she bid him farewell and left. Shortly afterward, Shen Ye grew frustrated as he couldn't figure out how to use the ever-fading cross he had received from the Tranquil Tong. In his anger, he threw it on the floor. However, he decided to test the powers he had gained from completing the summoning. Ever since he returned from the summoning, he had felt a cold sensation in his left palm, so he extended it to see what powers it held. As he did, he noticed that a cup of coffee, which was about to fall, suddenly froze in mid-air, astonishing him. Intrigued, he decided to test his immobilization ability on the heartless cat, freezing the ugly creature in mid-air for a few seconds. He even tried it on inanimate objects like books, which led him to conclude that the immobilization magic lasted only five seconds and could only be activated with his left palm. Some hours later, Old MacDonald and his minion walked into the cafe, informing Shen Yi that they had come to celebrate their victory against the Tranquil Tong and to discuss Villard. A few moments later, George and Su Ling shared an intimate conversation as they waited for Shen Yi to bring the coffee they had ordered. George asked how she felt after arresting the Tranquil Tong cultists, mentioning that everyone experiences different emotions after making their first arrest. Su Ling responded by revealing that she actually thought about her father in that moment. George reassured her that her father, who had once been a heroic witch but later turned villain, had nothing to do with her and that she didn't need to feel any guilt. However, Su Ling wasn't ready to discuss her father. Just then, Shen Yai arrived with the coffee, and the conversation shifted to Villard. George revealed that Villard was the high priest of the Tranquil Tongue and an extremely dangerous man who had once trained him in combat. He added that he and Villard had worked together a long time ago as a team capturing magical relics, but after achieving much together, they eventually went their separate ways. George further explained that, despite Villard's composed outward appearance, he was a total nutcase with a lot of loose screws in the head. As the team pondered what kind of man Villard truly was, George mentioned that Villard had the ability to change his appearance, making him nearly impossible to recognize. After sharing this information with Shen Yi, George and Su Ling took their leave. Later that afternoon, as the duo headed back to the bureau, George advised Su Ling to be cautious, warning her that there was a mole within the bureau, and it was only a matter of time before the traitor was exposed. The old nosy man then brought up the subject of Su Ling's father again, which angered her, as she wasn't in the mood to discuss the award recipient for the most useless father in the world. However, the word stop didn't exist in the old man's dictionary, so he continued to talk about how her father had brought suffering to countless people. Enraged, Su Ling then silenced his beaten up wide plate mouth, stating that he had no right to meddle in her personal affairs, even though they were partners. After saying this, Su Ling walked away, leaving the old drunk behind. Later that evening at George's home, he reflected on the situation with the mole in the bureau and the issue with Su Ling's father. Just then, he received a call from the bureau, informing him that the investigation was complete and that Villard was the mole inside the bureau. At that very moment, Villard materialized in front of George. Simultaneously back at the coffee shop, an ugly ass zombie staggered in, intent on erasing Shen Di from existence. Before Shen Yi could process how something could be so goddamn outrageously ugly, the zombie launched an attack, spitting out a fur-like, great a weapon at him. In that instant, Shen Di atomized, turning into mist to evade the attack. He then re-solidified into his human form and, using his immobilization power, froze the zombie. Knowing the immobilization would only last five seconds, Shen Li quickly transformed back into mist and escaped the shop, leaving the ugly ass, failed zombie assassin alone with the evil cat so the two ugly could bond. 
Meanwhile, back at George's place, George wondered how Villard had managed to bypass the heavy security measures in his home. Villard explained that he used a gift bestowed upon him by the god of the silent singer a thousand years ago. Villard then revealed that he had come to finally end George's worthless life for repeatedly thwarting his plans. Just then, Villard activated Bullseye, a magic relic that could attract any weapon with aerial technology. As Villard prepared to finish off the old man with the Joker's mouth, George unleashed his blade and lunged at him. However, George quickly realized his attacks were useless, as Villard had an invisible outer shield that protected him from any assault. Deciding that discretion was the better part of Valor, the old coward chose to flee his home by leaping out of a window. Unbeknownst to the old man, the entire congregation of the Tranquil Tongue was waiting for this very move with their magic circle fire blasts activated. The cult members unleashed an energy blast at George, which he managed to shield with his high-tech, James Bond-style umbrella. Unfazed, he slashed through the moronic cultists. After fending off several attacks, George attempted to escape the scene but, unfortunately for him, Villard was waiting, resolved to send him to the afterlife no matter what. Villard revealed that George had only been able to obtain information about his activities because Byron had betrayed him and disclosed the cult's top secrets. Realizing that his end had come, George made a call to the controller, instructing him to notify Su Ling of what had happened and to tell her to abandon the anti-magic bureau and live a normal teenage life. The two began to clash blades at incredible speed, but within seconds, George was outmatched. The Tranquil Tongue members surrounded him, their magic circles activated, ready to blast him to the afterlife. Shortly afterward, back at the coffee shop, Shen Yi, lost in thoughts comparing his past life to his present, was interrupted by Su Ling, who delivered the shocking news, George was dead. The revelation left Shen Yi utterly stunned. Upon hearing the devastating news, Shen Yi realized that since arriving in this world, George had been his only true friend. George had come to the coffee shop simply to spend time with him, without any ulterior motives. This realization steeled Shen Yi's resolve to avenge George's death and showcase his overpowered abilities to Villard. He then asked Su Ling for help locating Villard, and she informed him that the madman was likely near the city's port. Su Ling also mentioned that having eliminated George, Villard would probably be trying to escape the city through the suburbs and attempting to avoid the wrath of the Anti-Magic Bureau, which would have all their investigators on his trail. With this information, Shen Yai headed to the city's port, exuding the aura of the exterior god Silent Singer, hoping Villard would sense it and come out of hiding. Villard, on the verge of leaving the city to lie low in the Badlands until things calmed down, sensed the Silent Singer's aura and followed it. Upon arriving at the source of the aura, Villard was shocked to find George, or so he thought, waiting for him. The sight of the old man's face, who should have been in Nirvana, stunned Villard. Seconds later, Shen Di transformed back into his true form and revealed to Villard that he was a messenger of the Silent God, sent to inform him that his lowly sacrifices would never grant him his ultimate desire, the Eternal Tranquil Mind. Shen Di told Villard that if he truly wanted the Eternal Tranquil Mind, he would need to sacrifice his soul to obtain it. As this conversation unfolded, investigators from the Anti-Magic Bureau, led by A-Rank Investigator Ori, arrived at the scene. They immediately observed a large magical circle in the sky, with Villard ascending within it. As they tried to comprehend what was happening, Villard proclaimed that they were too late, as he was already on the verge of attaining the most coveted Eternal Tranquil Mind. Unbeknownst to Villard, this was all part of Shen Yi's ultimate plan to lure him to the warehouse, forcing him to summon Shen Yi as the Silent Singer God, and then trick him into sacrificing his soul. Villard, desperate for his desire, offered his soul as a sacrifice which was immediately sucked out of him, leaving him lifeless. His body plummeted to the ground with a thunderous crash, creating a hole in the earth. When Ori and the other investigators saw Villard fall from the sky like a meteor, they rushed to the scene only to find his lifeless body. The day before Villard's demise, right after George's tragic death, Su Ling returned to the coffee shop to report the news to Shen Yi. After hearing about George's death, Shen Yi suggested a drastic and forbidden course of action finding Byron, who might have the knowledge and power to resurrect George. Su Ling was stunned by the suggestion, knowing full well that resurrection was a forbidden dark sorcery. It was not only outlawed by the Anti-Magic Bureau, but also vehemently opposed by the nation's ruling cult, the Corona Order. Despite her reservations and understanding of the consequences, Su Ling decided to go along with Shen Yi's plan, 
even though it conflicted with her better judgment. That very night, George, who had already been buried by the Anti-Magic Bureau, was resurrected in secret. The forbidden ritual was carried out with Byron's help, bringing George back to life, but at a great cost. The next day, Su Ling returned to the coffee shop to deliver a report to Shen Yun. As they talked, she revealed that the Anti-Magic Bureau had held a meeting with all A rank and S rank investigators present, strategizing in the wake of recent events. With George effectively out of the Bureau, Su Ling had taken his place, stepping into the leadership role he left behind. Su Ling also mentioned that the recent summoning of exterior gods in the city had drawn the attention of people from around the world. The city had become a focal point for all those eager to witness the summoning of gods firsthand. Meanwhile, the newly resurrected George found himself conversing with Byron on the rooftop of Brian's ancient castle. Byron warned George that due to his forbidden resurrection, he would now be considered a fugitive. In this new life, George would be forced to live in hiding within the inner world, away from the eyes of the Anti-Magic Bureau and the Corona Order. Back at the coffee shop, Shen Yi was pleased that his plan had worked. He was glad that George had been resurrected and found solace in the thought that the old man would finally get the peace he had always longed for, free from the burdens of work. After bidding farewell to Su Ling, Shen Yi reflected on the success of his schemes, feeling a quiet satisfaction that everything had unfolded as he had intended. As Su Ling headed back to the Anti-Magic Bureau, she couldn't shake the feeling that Shen Yi was orchestrating everything from behind the scenes. She wondered if Shen Yi was manipulating everyone. The Anti-Magic Bureau, the Ash Cult Order, and the Tranquil Tongue Order, like pawns in a complex game of chess, where every move was under his control. As these thoughts raced through her mind, she suddenly felt an intense, burning pain in her stomach. Alarmed, she hurried to a secluded spot to investigate. To her shock, she discovered an insignia engraved on her stomach, glowing with a sinister energy. A few months later, business had been thriving for Shen Ye since the Tranquil Tongue incident to the point where he considered hiring an assistant for the store. After acquiring Billard's soul, which served as an archive of a thousand years worth of information, Shen Yai gained access to all the secrets and knowledge required to wield his magical relics. Billard's memories also held a vast array of arts and summoning incantations. Over the weeks, Shen Yi diligently practiced various rituals in the magic shop, using several summoning chants. One day, Shen Yi decided to summon an exterior god known as the Almighty, who ruled over the achromatic world, a realm of battles where followers were granted weapons of any kind. As he recited the summoning chants, he was transported to the achromatic city, a black and white world reminiscent of the 1940s. The city closely resembled a building from Shen Yi's memories, the city library. At that moment, Shen Yi sensed someone guiding him within the library so he transformed into the almighty god and ventured inside. Upon entering, he encountered a lady shaped like an hourglass with humongous talons. Shen Yi stared at the hot stuff, noting her striking resemblance to Aina, although she appeared more mature. On seeing Shen Yi, the Nikki Menage competition bowed before him and introduced herself as the Witch of Knowledge, the one who had awakened him. She informed Shen Yi that the Light Chaser had requested she retrieve his blade and in return, offer him a reward. Curious, Shen Yi asked the seductive witch what kind of reward she intended to give him. She revealed that she planned to offer him either a lap dance or one of her own blades. However, Shen Yi, sensing something amiss, refused to dish out simp content just yet. He suspected that the seductive woman might be a succubus sent to drain his powers. Just then, the witch pointed out that if he didn't desire the rewards she had mentioned, she could offer something even greater, insight into the future. Before revealing anything further, the witch offered a small, transparent, silvery glass orb as a sacrifice, explaining that it could serve as a weapon if used effectively. Shen Yai accepted her offering and then thrust his short sword inside her, sorry at her. Immediately after, the witch predicted the future, revealing that the Light Chaser would soon arrive in the city. She continued, stating that the Light Chaser would seek out the false god and utterly destroy him. Upon hearing this, Shen Yi grew anxious, Fearing that she was referring to him, as he had been impersonating various exterior gods that had been summoned. The witch added that the false god would fall from the heavens and cease to exist forever. In response, later that day, Shindi used Villard's soul, which held countless archive secrets, to learn more about the witch with the ginormous chest balls. According to Villard's catch of secrets, millennia ago, a prosperous kingdom that had defeated many other nations and seized their spoils of victory, 
eventually liberated a beautiful witch who had been sealed by a certain order during one of their wars. Thrilled with their newfound treasure, they displayed her in the plaza of the king's capital, flaunting her long silvery hair and well-rounded kiat for all the kingdom's simps to admire. This went on until one day, the witch decided to show her gratitude for her rescue by revealing the kingdom's future. She foretold that the prosperous nation would be wiped out and that every one of them would perish. Upon hearing this grim prophecy, the people became enraged and threatened to stone the witch to death. But in the blink of an eye, she vanished, never to be seen again. Decades passed, and the kingdom continued to thrive until they began to contemplate the afterlife and performed a ritual that summoned an evil exterior god, which led to the collapse of the entire kingdom. Reflecting on this, Shin Biai stared at the transparent silver orb the witch had given him, wondering if it could be transformed into an offensive weapon, as that was his ultimate goal for survival. At that moment, he clenched the orb tightly and commanded it to transform, and instantly, the orb gave him a complete makeover, turning him into a low-budget Willy Wonka. A few hours later, Shen Yai headed to the counter to make himself a cup of coffee. As he tried to open the door, the doorknob broke off with minimal effort, which amazed him. He then gave the door a slight push with his foot, and it flew off its hinges as if struck by the Incredible Hulk. Shen Ye realized that, in addition to gaining an offensive weapon, he had also become the strongest man alive. A few minutes later, Shen Ye sat down with his coffee and decided to test his newfound invincibility by slicing his palm, only to discover that his hand wasn't invincible as blood began to gush out. Meanwhile, a random blonde walked in and witnessed Shen Ye's self-inflicted wound, which piqued her interest. The Dilulu blonde continued to stare at Shen Yu and soon began to experience a schizophrenic episode, imagining him as a full-fledged vampire drinking his own blood, which raised her up. Noticing the crackpot, Shen Nai invited her to sit down for coffee. As she took her seat, Shen Di offered to take her order, and she replied that she wanted a taste of his white cream. Shen Di didn't understand what the heck the hysterical bitch was talking about, so he offered to give her a warm coffee instead. As Shen Yi brought the coffee to the deranged girl, he noticed that being close to the cultured maniac made her drip water from her floodgates. Shortly afterward, the blonde began rambling about a mysterious cafe owner who manipulates everyone like chess pieces, claiming that even the tranquil tongue in the anti-magic bureau could withstand his power. Shen Yai, unable to understand her incoherent babble, demanded to know why she had come. At that moment, she introduced herself as the boss of the Taskmasters, the group responsible for maintaining the balance of the inner world and ensuring that nothing disturbs it. The mysterious blonde went on to reveal that a new and unknown organization called Absent Eyes had recently emerged. Although the Taskmaster Agency initially dismissed them as harmless, the group had gone rogue days ago, isekaiing people within the world and causing a large-scale massacre. She added that their powers were both mysterious and unparalleled, prompting her to seek Shen Yi's help in exacting revenge. She proposed offering her body as payment, noting that most females actually enjoy using their bodies instead of their money, but most of you V-cards wouldn't have known that. However, Shen Yai had no idea what she was talking about and wondered what she must be smoking. However, Shen Yai revealed to her that, tempting as her offer might be, he wouldn't simp like most of the viewers, and preserving his worthless life was of utmost importance to him. Upon hearing this, the insomniac blonde left in a huff, vowing to return and win Shen Yi over at all costs. Meanwhile, Shen Yai grew increasingly concerned about the declining finances of the coffee business and realized he needed to act quickly to avoid bankruptcy. At that moment, he remembered the ring of revolving fate, which brought luck during the day and misfortune at night. He immediately put on the ring, hoping to boost his sales. Just when he thought the ring was useless, an old man looking very demure approached Shen Yi and praised his coffee, declaring it the best in the city. The old man explained how the acidity of the coffee, combined with its bright and reactive flavor, made it superior to Starbucks. He then handed Shen Yi a red envelope stuffed with $100 bills and introduced himself as Jonas. Later that night, as Shen Li slept, he suddenly felt himself being summoned and fell into a trance. When he opened his eyes, he found himself inside the Ash Cult Temple. At that moment, Shen Yi saw Aina, who had summoned him. Excited, he moved toward her, gently grabbed her cheek, and stared deeply into her eyes, noticing her striking resemblance to the silver-haired witch. Shen Yi tried to speak to her, but quickly realized she was in a trance, so he asked why she had summoned him. Anna revealed that she had called upon him to provide information about the menace known as the Absent Eyes. 
She explained that the association was attempting to summon an exterior world god, but during their efforts, many of their members went mad and began slaughtering people in the world like cattle. Anna tried to reveal more secrets, but Shen Yi noticed that the transmission was lagging, like an old Android phone on a 2G network. In response, he lightly slapped her head to reset her brain cells back to normal. With her mind clearer, Aina asked whether the Ash Cult, who were also threatened by the absent eyes, should proceed to fight them. Shen Yi cryptically answered that time would tell. As the trance was about to end, Shen Yi was summoned again, but this time as the God of Heavenly Fog by Brian. Upon seeing Brian, Shen Yi wondered why he had to endure seeing his ugly face, but Brian quickly asked if the God knew anything about the Salian dynasty, who had invited him to join the Dull Dust. Brian mentioned that he had already sworn allegiance to the God of Heavenly Fog and sought guidance. Hearing this, Shen Yi casually told him he could join any group he wished, even the Justice League. Shortly afterward, Shen Yi woke up from the trance and quickly picked up Villard's soul orb to gather information about the Salian dynasty and the Dull Dust. According to the orb, the Salian dynasty are descendants of the royal family, wealthy, influential, and extremely proud. The Dull Dust, on the other hand, were a group of the most powerful and mysterious sorcerers in the world, having existed for thousands of years. The next morning, Su Ling walked into the coffee shop, and the evil cat wouldn't stop giving her an ominous stare. Just then, Shen Yi appeared and asked why she had come so early. Su Ling explained that she needed information about who murdered a kind old man who often gave money to kids in the slums. She added that she had come to him, because the entire anti-magic bureau was preoccupied with the absent eyes, who were causing nationwide concern. Upon hearing the mention of the absent eyes, Shen Yi decided to string Su Ling along to gather more information about the group. He indirectly inquired about the cult's modus operandi. Su Ling then disclosed that the anti-magic bureau had classified the absent eyes as a secret cult, and their top A-rank investigators had been dispatched to eliminate them. Shen Yi then asked for a favor in return for providing information about the old man she had inquired about earlier. He requested that she investigate and gather information on the light chaser and the false god. Will Shen Gai eliminate the threat from the absent eyes cult? Comment, summon God, if you're eager to find out in our part two. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more content like this. As always, thanks for watching.